We're getting closer now. The goal is to bring the ZX Spectrum Turing Edition to life. This machine is unusual. There's no ULA, no Z80. In fact, there's no hardware ALU, no program counter, and not even an instruction register. Everything's been abstracted into software. Registers are implemented as variables in static RAM, and ALU operations are stored in lookup tables. That makes it about as close to being a pure software spectrum as you can get. And yet it still runs in real time. Well, hopefully. Think of it as the software engineer's version of the machine. You only need to get your head around three different types of silicon chip, and two of them are memories. But the big question is, can it actually play Manic Minor? In the last video, we got the Raster Generator working, and before that, the Random Access Tree Machine built from EEPROMs, Static RAMs, D-Type flip-flops, and some other CTL glue logic. The next step is to stitch these two pieces together. Now, the Sinclair boot logo is nice, but it doesn't really push the hardware or display color. If we're going to shake this system out properly, we need a game, and that game is Manic Miner. Sounds simple enough, until you run into the quirks of the Z80 instruction set. Assembly programmers love the Z80. So many instructions. Microcoders, not so much. And here's why. Take the 09 hex op code, which is inherited from the old Intel 8080. It performs a 16-bit addition of BC to HL and updates the carry and half carry flags. Straightforward enough. Now, compare it to the instruction at ED4A, which is an extended Z80 instruction that adds BC to HL with carry. The difference sounds small. One ignores the carry going into the addition, the other uses it. So I thought, fine, I'll just reuse the same microcode, and for the 8080 version, I'll just force carry into be zero. Problem solved, right? Not quite. The 8080 version leaves the overflow, sign, and zero flags completely unaffected, but the Z80 version updates them. That subtle mismatch means you can't just recycle microcode. If you do, you get incorrect flags, the machine starts misbehaving. These are the little gotchas that trip you up constantly when you're writing microcode for the Z80. You don't just have to worry about the operation itself. You have to check and then recheck all the flags and all the side effects for very similar sounding instructions. I spent days double checking the Z80 manual, implementing one tiny edge case after another. In the end, I've implemented nearly all of the 8080 instructions set and well over half of the Z80 extension instructions. And the payoff? Manic Miner runs. At least, under the first room, which is a big milestone. So, the CPU core works, but can it actually talk to the video circuitry? The next step is leaking the CPU with the Rust generator. The CPU is still clocked by the Arduino, which keeps things manageable, but the video has to run in real time or nothing will display properly. I'm going to move from NTSC timing to VGA timing, and the frequencies double. Character clock goes from 895 kHz to 1.89 MHz, and the dot clock goes from 7.16 MHz to 14.32 MHz. Now, within each 8 pixel window, the CPU gets two opportunities to write to the video memory. Meanwhile, the raster generator gets two opportunities to read, one for pixel data and one for the attribute byte. The attribute read has to be timed so that it latches into a 74HC574 register just before it's needed and that sets the timing for everything else in the circuit. This effectively clocks the CPU at 3.58 MHz, and here's the kicker. CPU memory writes must land precisely inside these windows. Miss the windows, and you get garbage on the screen. So, the theory looks good, but does it actually work in practice? Step 1. Swap out the EEPROM for static RAM. I know the scan-out circuitry works at high speed, and I know that the CPU works when clocked slowly. The unknowns are the CPU memory address registers driving the video static RAM, 74HC373 latch in transparent mode, basically behaving like a tri-state buffer, and the right circuitry for the static RAM. To test it, I built a circuit using a pair of D-type flip-flops from a 74HC74. When the CPU's memory write signal goes low, the left flip-flop latches are zero, indicating that the address and data are valid. Then, on the next positive edge of CPU clock bar, that signal gets passed into the right flip-flop, which then feeds back and sets the flip-flop on the left. 
when the high-speed CPU clock from the video circuit goes low, the write signal into the SRAM goes low, and the video shadow RAM write occurs. That clock goes high, the one from the left flip-flop is latched into the right flip-flop, and the write signal goes high, and the circuit's back to its wait state until another m write signal. The result? A clean, one-cycle low pulse every time the memory write signal is asserted, but fixed in the raster generator clock domain. Practice. Make minor appears, but it's corrupted. One pixel n eight's wrong, and the attribute memory update corrupts the colors. So the machine's alive, but it's haunted. Debugging is where you really learn how these machines work, and in this case, I face an extra challenge over a simple repair. I don't know if this is a good design with a bad chip or something simple, or if it's a design flaw. I did all the normal visual checks and voltage checks. Nothing. Next suspect, the data lines. I tried grounding them individually. Dangerous, yes, but quick. When I grounded D2, the image improved dramatically. In fact, it looked like Manic Miner with D2 grounded. That told me that the memory address registers are probably wired correctly and functioning fine. The image appears perfectly stable in scan out, so the corruption seems to be occurring during writes. What about the 74HC373 itself? This is where I may have gotten a bit too clever for myself. If I'd used a 74HC245 bidirectional buffer, then the random access Turing machine could still write to the video static RAM like it does with the 373, but it could also read from the static RAM and I could test the whole memory system at low speed. What to do? Now, it turns out that I have a spare 74HC245 in the circuit, already wired into the CPU data bus, and ready to receive input from the keyboard. What if I temporarily connect the keyboard side of this 245 to the video static RAM data bus, and pull out the 74HC373? This gives me an alternate path into the video SRAM, and isolates the 373 out of the circuit. I've wired that up, pulled out the 373, but instead of fixing the problem, I got the same error, and just on a different bit. That's odd. Having two independent pathways fail means it's probably got something to do with the video static RAM. If the CPU static RAM was failing, we wouldn't be running any code. Maybe the static RAM chip was too slow. I swapped it for a faster one. No change. Okay, maybe it's timing. The address lines might not be settling before the right signal fires. Looking at the data sheets, the 74HC257 multiplexes take up to 20 nanoseconds to output a stable address, and the 74HC574s take around 16 nanoseconds. Meanwhile, the 74HC32 OR gate that generates the right pulse can settle in 9 nanoseconds. That means the right pulse could easily be asserted 10 nanoseconds before the address lines are stable. According to the 628128 data sheet, that's not allowed, so that's a recipe for corrupted data. So I spent ages trying to delay the start of the right signal, making it sure it came after the address and settled. On paper, that should have worked. In reality, no difference. At that point, I had three different theories, three different fixes, and nothing worked. So. Where's the real problem hiding? Time to go back to basics. I probed every single connection, and that's when I spotted something suspicious. Q2 on the 74HC373 had no continuity with D2 on the static RAM 628128. These should be connected. The solder joint looked fine, but the wire was actually broken inside the insulation. The insulation was holding it in place just enough to fool me during the visual check. I rewired it properly, fired up the board, and suddenly, Manic Miner looked clean. But the story didn't end there. Remember the bypass path that I added with the 74HC245? That failed too. So I pulled out the chip, put it in the chip tester, and discovered that D5 of that chip was actually bad. What are the odds of this happening? Two independent faults, one broken wire and one faulty chip, both producing the same kind of corruption. Must be tiny and that makes debugging so deceptive, yet surprisingly rewarding. The moral here is, always keep an open mind when debugging, because sometimes you're fighting more than one gremlin at a time. The other moral? Keep testing theories. With the wiring fixed and the faulty chip removed, everything finally clicked into place. 
the random access Turing machine, clocked by the Arduino, the raster generator driving the real-time display, and on-screen Manic Miner running on a ZX Spectrum Turing edition. Next challenge, see if I can run the CPU at 3.579 MHz. I have to remove the D-type flip-flops, connect up the video clock to the CPU clock, and Manic Miner in real time. No support Arduino. Actually, this was the second try. I hadn't connected up the bright signal to the video static RAM properly, but I found out pretty quickly and didn't get a chance to record it. There we go. Major breakthrough. So, the next question is, how fast does it run? I timed how long it took for the air to run out of this room, and it was 173 seconds. Then, I checked the timing on the ZX Spectrum No ULA build, which does use the Z80. It's slightly overclocked at 3.579 MHz, and there's no CPU slowdown for memory contention, so this is going to be faster than the actual Spectrum, but it took 135 seconds for the same task. So, clock for clock, Turing Z80 is about 30% slower than the actual Z80, and that's actually better than I was expecting. By contrast, the Turing 6502 is about three times slower than the actual 6502. At this clock speed, the tape interface won't work and the SAM will be off, and that's just at a minimum. But if I use 50 nanosecond EEPROMs and 50 nanosecond static RAMs, I think I'll be able to double the CPU clock rate up to 7.159 MHz, which should make the Turing Z80 about 30% faster than the 3.579 MHz Z80. Then I can insert no-op cycles into the state machine and try and get the timing as close to the actual Z80 as possible. This is a huge milestone the very first time the Turing Z80 has been bought up to full speed. Think about what that means for a moment. We started with Alan Turing's abstract idea of a machine and gave it form. 256 symbols, 4096 states, and then extended it with random access and indirect addressing. We mapped it to the 48k spectrum memory, and now here it is, running classic games in something very close to real time. Every detail of how this machine operates is captured inside a single large EEPROM, the rulebook of our Turing machine. It's really all implemented in software. That's why I call this the software engineer's version of the Spectrum. But this is only the beginning. In the next video, I'll push it further by running Zextoc, a program that tests every single Z8 instruction. Only then will we know if this Spectrum can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the original. And while I'm working at that, I'll also be releasing some Commodore 64 videos, so stay tuned. Things are about to get very interesting.